research seminars. Um, Dr. Whittingham is the director of the Centre for Muslim and Christian Studies in Oxford. He also has a faculty post in the Department of um, Theology and Religions here, isn't it? Yeah, at the University of Oxford as well. Um, his interests are obviously Muslim and Christian relations, um, as well as working on a variety of aspects, both in terms of classical studies and the emergence of, of, of Muslim thought and the reception of Christian thought within um, the Muslim scholarly discourse. So, um, with that, we will we'll move to listen to his paper about the Injil and how it's been treated in the Quran. Thank you very much, Ali Reza. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've been boring several people since I've arrived with the fact that I grew up around here. So although I don't live in Birmingham now, I've spent the first 20 years of my life here and I knew this building very well from the outside, but have never stepped across the threshold. So it's a particular pleasure to be here and back on um, home territory, as it were, and to see Ali Reza again, who's been down to Oxford to, to visit us. Okay, um, what I'm doing here is probably going to be raising more questions than offering answers. So um, I'll, I'll say that at the outset, I'm not offering more questions than answers, but it's a, that's hence the title of the, um, <coughs> the talk, a, an exploration of the, uh, the implications of the Quranic term in Jeev. And I should also say, and you, you, you might be familiar with people sometimes saying this, that um, I realise my sources are terribly sunny in this. Um, I pre prepared this talk previously and um, I haven't had time to go and mine various Shia sources. So um, I'm very open to good suggestions, by the way, while I'm here. This would be very valuable if you want to uh, point me towards particular people that you think are um, would be useful for me to look at. So, um, but I'm, I'm very conscious of that. I mean, I'm very interested in Shia Islam as well, but my sources for this will tend to be uh, are rather Sunni. Um, rather than being a balance or a mixture. You know, it's just the history of how I, how I first set this up. Um, there is a handout. I'm sorry, it, it hasn't quite come out right in terms of the layout. And it would be, does anyone need a copy of your book? Um, it would be gratifying, it would be gratifying for me to think that I think, you know, it's got, one or two things have got altered in the transition from one computer system to another. Now, now I'm beginning to think, actually, maybe I didn't save some of those final changes that I made to it. So, for example, this box at the top should cover, that's my structure, basically. I'm, I'm a bit low-tech today, and I'm not using PowerPoint and so forth, but that box, which should cover all seven points, is the, the structure of where we're going. Uh, and then there's a few references to some of the works I'm using, uh, only some. So then, obviously, the Quranic verse really goes on the other side with its translation. So if anything seems slightly quirky, then um, that I think it's probably my, my mistake. But uh, no, thank you to Uxana for all the lineup and sorting out handouts and all these kinds of things. Excuse me. Okay, well, let's begin more formally. Um, where I'm going, as you can see from the structure, I'll look at these different categories. And towards the end, I'll just make a few comments on the Apostle Paul as well, and the nature of the Injil, and the possible natures of it. Um, but the study is <coughs> principally Quranic, with some um, awareness of Muslim Christian issues coming in as well, and mutual um, perceptions and understandings. So. so the term Injil occurs 12 times in the Quran, predominantly in verses traditionally ascribed to the Medinan period most occurring in Surah Al-Imran and Al-Ma'idah. The term Injil is obviously significant, both in Quranic studies itself, but also in relation to the wider concerns of Muslim-Christian relations. Now, the approach here will be to remain, as I said, firmly focused on the Quranic text, but with occasionally some cross-references to issues of Muslim-Christian interest. I begin by considering the etymology of the term Injil, briefly, before moving on to discuss the Quranic concept of the Injil and its revelation. Thirdly, the question of the content of the Injil is then explored, after which a historical question is raised. This historical question relates to the fact that the Quran makes some positive statements about the Injil, prompting exploration of exactly what text or content is being endorsed at the time of the rise of Islam. The views of Ibn Taymiyyah, 
feature periodically. I imagine he needs no introduction um, since he offers a number of statements on the matter. But a number of other figures will also feature, both from classical and more recent periods. <coughs> so the intent here is not to provide a, an absolutely detailed historical survey, but to be a, a conversation partner in varied Muslim discussions of the issues raised below. So looking at etymology, exploring the etymology of the term Injil does not necessarily shed great light on its meaning in the Qur'an. Some early Arab authorities tried to find an Arabic origin for the term in the root Nunjin Nam, Najla. Al-Qurtubi suggests that Najl could mean root or water or breath, hence the Injil being then a broad source of light and guidance and he offers other possibilities too. But others reject the Arabic origin of the term, including the exegetes as Zamakhshari and al-Baydawi. They say, no, that's, that's not where we go to explain this word. <clears throat> the most likely origin is that Injil can be traced back to the Greek euangelion, or good news, that has entered Arabic via the Ethiopic wangel. This is the view of uh, Arthur Jeffrey in his Book, the foreign vocabulary of the Quran. Jeffrey points out that the long vowel ending in this Ethiopic term, echoing the long second syllable of Injil, is a closer resemblance than another proposed route for the Greek euangelion getting into Arabic via the Syriac evangelion. So he's saying the Ethiopic seems more similar. Now, the assumption that some Quranic terms were originally non-Arabic words can be seen as controversial, but not as I understand it when they are proper nouns with names. But you can comment on that in the question tab. Okay, moving on to the concept. What is the Quranic understanding of the Injil as revelation? This question relates to the wider question of how both Muslims and Christians understand the phenomenon of revelation. According to the Qur'an, the Injil is a message sent down to Jesus in the same way that the Taurat was sent to Moses and the Qur'an to Muhammad. Perfectly familiar, I'm sure, what I'm saying here. That is, without any human involvement. The Qur'an states that God gave, Ate Nahu, he gave Jesus the Gospel. al Ma'ida 46, Al-Hadid 27. <clears throat> and also that God taught him it. Al-Lamtu, Al-Ma'idah, 110. So God gave or taught Jesus the Injil. Furthermore, it is commonly thought that the Injil was given to Jesus all at once. This is a common view of exegetes, contrasted with the Qur'an being sent down in stages, for example, as Zamakhshari and many others. As Suyuti in his Itqan mentions a tradition that the Injil was sent down on the 13th day of Ramadan, Note also that the word Injil is always singular, though the Arabic plural anajil was developed later, but in the Qur'an it's always singular. And just in passing, the recent Qur'an translation by Abdul Halim on one occasion translates Injil as Gospels, plural. Al-Imran 65. I'm not conscious of any specific reason for doing that. Whether the Injil was a book in the lifetime of Jesus is not stated in the Qur'an, though the clear assumption in Muslim thinking is that the Injil took on the form of a book as did the Qur'an. But for Christians at the time of the rise of Islam, as for today, none of this is their understanding of the meaning of the term gospel. Rather than being a message sent down to Jesus, Christians understand the term gospel as follows, I'll just give a brief summary. First, it can refer to the message about Jesus' life, death and resurrection, proclaimed either by Jesus himself or by his followers. By the way, and Abdul Halim capture this in their entry on Injil in their Arabic-English Dictionary of Quranic Usage. And I quote, The Christian tradition speaks about it being synonymous with the good news taught about Jesus. This is the Injil speaks about it being synonymous with the good news taught about Jesus, whereas the Islamic concept of Al-Injil 
places emphasis on the notion of a divinely revealed text. Unquote. <clears throat> Secondly, and relatedly, in Christian understanding, the term gospel can denote one of four books regarded by Christians as divinely inspired and authoritative, known as gospels and contained in the, the New Testament. This understanding of gospel as book is closely related to the first meaning of gospel as message about Jesus, since the New Testament gospels are regarded by Christians as an account of the good news about Jesus. So the gospel according to John is the good news according to John, that is, an account of the message about Jesus. <clears throat> it's worth noting in passing that these differences in the Muslim and Christian understandings of Injil and Gospel reflect, obviously, wider differences in the concept of revelation between Muslims and Christians, wider differences in the understanding of the concept of revelation. Differences revolving around the extent to which human involvement can coexist alongside authoritative divine inspiration, or whether divine inspiration and human involvement are in fact mutually exclusive in terms of scriptural revelation. <clears throat> this affects issues such as the idea that the Injil or other scriptures can have authors, for example, which would be more of a Christian understanding, obviously, and the permissibility or desirability of translation but these wider issues need not detain us here. One further important issue is that of reliable transmission. Again, too involved to be discussed at length here. I should say, perhaps, as I was chairing a seminar just as Ali Reza is now, just 24 hours ago, and I was very conscious at that time in my comfortable chair's seat that actually the hard work in a seminar is usually done by the speaker in the question time. And beforehand in preparing the paper, but then also in the um, question time, the actual delivery of the paper, as long as one doesn't lose one's place or forget what you want to say. So uh, you might have questions about what I'm saying here. When we get to that point, I meant to say that at the beginning. Anyway, suffice it to say that the idea that the Quran is the supreme Mutawatir text means that any text perceived to be in conflict with that text cannot by definition be regarded as correct. And in this regard, it's interesting to speculate on the role of the Quranic Hawari Yul, regarded as the disciples of Jesus. This is in relation to transmission. The Quran does not comment on whether or not they should be understood as being, being involved in transmitting the Injil. <clears throat> so, between Muslims and Christians, we have two different traditional concepts of gospel or Injil in operation. One is of a message sent down to Jesus all at once. The other is of a message about Jesus, records which Christians view as divinely inspired, but also humanly authored. <clears throat> what are the implications of there being two different concepts of gospel between Muslims and Christians? Well, since the canonical New Testament gospels do not seem to fit the Muslim expectation of what the Injil should be like, Muslim scholars have proposed the existence of a pure, original Injil, which is partly, or sometimes barely at all, preserved in the New Testament Gospels. So this leads us to the question of the proposed content of the Quranic Injil. So we're now reaching the fourth part of my structure, the content, <clears throat> from a Quranic point of view at this, at this stage. Now the Quran does not provide much comment on the content of the Injil, though the emphasis on continuity between different scriptures, for example, Al Imran, verse 3, means that it is always assumed that the Quranic Injil would affirm the core Quranic doctrines of Tawheed, the warning of judgment, and that the Injil also affirms the Taurat. As for other details, the Injil is said to mention Muhammad, Al-Araf, verse 157. It is also said to promise heavenly reward for those who fight in God's cause. Surah at tawbah 111. The Injil also, from a Quranic perspective, includes a parable of believers portrayed as a plant growing strongly, Al-Fat 29. Now it's plausible that the Quranic Injil may also be thought to include aspects of Jesus' life as portrayed in the Quran such as his creation and enlivening of clay birds. 
excuse me, Island Round 49. However, this is open to question, as it is sometimes argued by Muslim scholars that the Injil contained commands and precepts taught by Jesus rather than a history of his life. You know, a history of Jesus' life is only one model for what we might be talking about. So, for example, the 20th century uh, writer Rashid Rida, Lebanese originally, but famous in, in his Egyptian phase of his life, he states that the Injil consists of, quote, warnings, wisdom, and precepts that God Almighty revealed to the Messiah. Unquote. As a result, Rida, while skeptical of many New Testament teachings, is more willing to accept Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, which comes in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 to 7 in the New Testament. He's more open to accepting that style of teaching, since it fits these criteria which he has listed. <coughs> Although he does not make this explicit, he presumably thinks that it is these passages to which the Christians at the time of Muhammad should have responded. The parable in uh, Surah al fat 29 likening believers to a strong plant. This has some parallels to the parable of the sower, found, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. However, there are, of course, many differences between the Quran and the New Testament. For wherever Christians deny certain components of the Muslim view of the Injil, this has prompted charges of alteration of the text, tahrif lafzi, or of alteration of its interpretation, Tahrid Manam. An example of the second, that is, corrupt interpretation of the text, would be failing to discern references to Muhammad in the Bible, or misunderstanding metaphorical statements about Jesus and the Father, taking them literally, when the argument would be they should be taken more metaphorically. These would be examples of Tahrid Manam. <coughs> It's worth noting in passing that a number of significant writers give considerable scope, Muslim writers I mean, to the view of biblical corruption as mainly relating to its wrong interpretation rather than focusing on a corrupt text. These include Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Khaldun, perhaps the very famous historian and sociologist uh, from North Africa. <coughs> but in practice, this does not lead them to accept the entire biblical text overall. Where New Testament teachings diverge from the Quran or Muslim interpretation of the Quran, for example, on whether the crucifixion of Jesus occurred, the New Testament is unsurprisingly to be rejected. And uh, I took the slightly narcissistic step of including a piece of my own writing in the bibliography because it outlines what Ibn Khaldun says about exactly these issues and how he responds to the Bible. Half of the article there is about Ibn Khaldun's interaction with the biblical text. So it seems relevant if you want a bit of background. So to summarise, the content of the Injil as understood in Quranic terms is in some ways rather different from how Christians understand it. However, there are verses where the Quran seems to affirm the Injil. For example, Al-Ma'idah 46, as I think we've already said, where it's described as Huda, guidance, and Nur, light. So an obvious historical question presents itself. If the Quranic Injil diverges from the New Testament Gospels, <coughs> to what text of the Injil is the Quran referring when it makes positive comments? I trust that's, that's clear. Should I say that again? Is that clear enough? Not at all. When the, when the Quran is positive about the Injil, what, what actual text might it be referring to? This question is not only textual, but of course, historical. Now, turning to the historical question, the, the referent for the Quranic term in Jil, the key verse here, or an interesting verse here, is Al-Ma'idah 47, which is, as I said, probably by my mistake, ended up rather tucked at the bottom of the uh, first sheet of the handout. وَلْيَحْكُمْ أَحْلُ الْإِنْجِيلِ بِمَا أَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ so let the followers of the gospel, or the people of the gospel, judge according to what God has sent down in it. Those who do not judge according to what God has revealed 
are lawbreakers. So this is appealing to the Injil as a source of judgment. There is a question over the correct reading of this verse. Um, this is just a point of detail, but I wanted to mention it as many exegetes do. As Ibn Taymiyyah and other exegetes explain, let the followers of the gospel judge, well yakum, is a command using the, the jasid mood, jazm. An alternative reading, which exegetes mention, uses the subjunctive, well yakuma, which would correspond to so that the followers of the gospel judge. So rather than it being a command, it's more of an explanation. This would express the reason why Jesus was given the Injil, namely so that the people of the gospel could judge by it. But this difference in readings does not affect the heart of the verse's meaning, as Ad Pabari states in his commentary. In other words, he mentions both these and says, this isn't crucial for the heart of the discussion. Now this verse has been interpreted in various ways, linked to the question of whether Al-Ma'idah 47 is exhorting Christians, in some sense, to follow the Injil available at the time of the rise of Islam, which would indicate that the Injil in circulation in the first or seventh century was a valid criterion for judgment. So this raises the question of what form of the Injil is being invoked here. <coughs> The occasions of revelation literature, the Asbab and Nuzul, does not really help here. Al Wahid is Asbab and Nuzul on this verse, and the ones preceding it, narrates a story about Muhammad finding out whether the Torah does or does not include the penalty for stoning for adultery. Moving on to Tafsir and other literature, there are various proposals about how the term Injil should be understood in, the, in this verse. First, is it referring to a command given to the people of the Injil before the time of Muhammad? Whereas after the time of the Prophet, they should consult the Quran. So it was for a time, but that time is over. Ibn Kathir, in his tafsir, is one who mentions this possibility. But Ibn Taymiyyah points out in his work, Al Jawab al Sahih Liman Baddal Adin al Masih. The correct answer to those who change the religion of the Messiah, Ibn Taymiyyah points out that this is impossible, this explanation that Ibn Kathir and others offer, because God would not issue a command to those who had died before that command was issued. In other words, they died before the um, coming of the Quran. So it doesn't make sense, that interpretation, in his view. Ibn Hazm, the well known Spanish um, he emphatically denies the truth of the Sabbath and Nuzul recorded by al Wahidi. He then states that the verse refers to God sending down the necessity to believe in Muhammad, his prophet, and that this is therefore what the Christian should believe. Interestingly, in a different work, he, uh, he actually says, well, that verse is abrogated. So he has two different takes on this question, Ibn Hazm. As for the fate of the text of the original Injil, quoting Ibn Hazm now, the gospel sent down from God, the original and the true one, disappeared, except for small sections which God preserved as a proof against them, and a shame for them, for the Christians, that is. <coughs> I should say, someone like Ibn Taymiyyah, who in some ways is parallel to Ibn Hazm, they're both well known for their pretty stringent views, he has a much more um, accepting view of the biblical text. This was actually the subject of the seminar I was chairing just yesterday, Ibn Taymiyyah's view of the biblical text. Um, but despite this dismissal by Ibn Hazm, al Ma'ida 47 would appear to be appealing to, to something called the Gospel as existing in the first or seventh century. If so, another explanation is, were there two versions circulating at the time of Muhammad, one pure and one corrupted. And in case you think I've just created this possibility myself, this is Ibn Taymiyyah's suggestion. He identifies this as a plausible position. He states in his tafsir, different work from the Jawab, he states in his tafsir that a proper Muslim view of the Taurat and Injil 
is as follows. And this quotation is on the uh, back of the handout, if you want to read it. <coughs> it says, a proper Muslim view is that in the world there are true sahih copies, and these remain until the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and many copies which are corrupted. The Quran commands them to judge with what Allah reveals in the Torah and Injil. Allah informs that in both there is wisdom, or hikmah. There is nothing in the Quran to indicate that they altered all copies. This reflects what I'm saying about this view that there, are, that there, were, there were different versions circulated. So Ibn Taymiyyah's solution is thus to assume that the Quran gives grounds for believing that there must have been some reliable version of the Injil in circulation at the time of the rise of Islam, as well as some unreliable ones. He does not state whether these reliable versions had disappeared by the time he was writing, <coughs> in the 12-1300s CE, though this seems to be the implication. To accept his argument as conclusive, however, it will be necessary to find evidence of uncorrupted and different Gospels which had previously been accepted as authentic by Christians. This is separate from what are known as apocryphal or non-canonical Gospels, which are in general very different from the New Testament Gospels and were never regarded as authoritative by large numbers of Christians. <coughs> Abdullah Said, the Maldivian Muslim scholar, writing in 2002, notes that by the time of Muhammad's preaching, the Christian scriptures were documented and were the same as those used today. He argues that, quote, since the Quran refers to those same scriptures, its references to them should equally apply in the modern era. This is perhaps the main challenge to Ibn Taymiyyah's position. So Abdullah Said is taking a yet more potentially positive view, if you want to call it that. <coughs> However, a recent writer, Muhammad Abu Layla, identifies four other challenges to Ibn Taymiyyah's position. This is in his book, The Quran and the Gospels, A Comparative Study. These, these challenges to Ibn Taymiyyah's position arise not from apparent tensions with historical or manuscript evidence, but from factors arising from Islamic principles. First, if a sound version of the Injil endured until the time of Muhammad and presumably beyond, why did no early Muslim mention it in books? Secondly, why was it not preserved by Muslims? Thirdly, Muhammad would surely have safeguarded a proposed original Injil. And fourthly, Muhammad would not have allowed the four New Testament Gospels to eclipse the pure original Injil. Does that all make sense or should I review those? Is that clear enough? <coughs> now, just in passing, it's interesting that despite his statements in his tafsir, which I just quoted from Ibn Taymiyyah, he himself puts forward a different, more traditional view in his book Al-Jawab al-Sahih. We were just discussing earlier this week, you know, the, with any scholar, Muslim, Christian, or whoever, when they produce a vast number of works, to what extent can one demand absolute consistency, or to what extent should one even expect gradual development and change in thought? I mean, that's an unanswerable question. But people like Ibn Tamir and for example. Uh, in in Al-Jawab al-Sahih, he interprets the reference in this verse we're looking at to what God sent down in the Injil as a command about following Muhammad. Quote, God handed down in the Gospel the command to follow Muhammad, just as he commanded it in the Torah. <coughs> Can Ibn Taymiyyah's two different statements be reconciled? Perhaps it can be stated that they are not in direct conflict since a command to follow Muhammad, or at least a prediction of him, can be found according to some Muslim exegesis in the extant New Testament Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, in other words. This would be consistent with the view Ibn Taymiyyah expresses in his tafsir that some sound version of the Injil was in existence in the 1st or 7th century. However, this would still leave Ibn Taymiyyah with the problem that those Gospels contain plenty of information about Jesus, such as his crucifixion, which no Muslim usually accepts. <coughs> Abu Layla mentions two further possible proposals 
as to what the true Injil represents. One is that where the New Testament Gospels contain statements spoken by Jesus, spoken by Jesus, or truths taught by him, that is the Injil, just in passing occasionally copies of the biblical text um, put the actual words of Jesus in the four Gospels in red, so that they, so that they stand out and it's purely a printing convention, it doesn't have any other significance. But if they did, then it would be those red passages which are being um, mentioned here. However, Abu Layla points out that this means of identifying the Injil would still include many statements unacceptable to Muslim thought. A second suggestion is that the Injil can be found in those passages where all four New Testament Gospels agree. Here, the problem for Abu Layla, I mean, the problem from his point of view, his objection is that this would include accounts of the crucifixion of Jesus. Again, unacceptable to almost all Muslims. These discussions of which text is invoked in verses such as Al-Ma'idah 47 highlight the diversity of Muslim views in attempting to explore two different ideas. One of these ideas is the apparently positive attitude of such verses and others towards some form of the Injil. And on the other hand, the disagreement between the New Testament Gospels extant in the 1st or 7th century and the teachings of Islam, which the Injil is supposed to affirm. Now, I'll just turn at this point to a few comments on the Apostle Paul and the Injil uh, before concluding. <coughs> now, from my reading of Muslim texts, the Injil is often discussed in the context of the Gospels found in the New Testament. You know, so if there's a comparison to be done and so forth, then the obvious place to look <coughs> is that the, the four New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But when I use the phrase New Testament, obviously that includes other works as well. The New Testament has always, from a Christian point of view, since before the rise of Islam, included other writings, notably the book called the Acts of the Apostles, and letters or epistles, including a number written by the Apostle Paul. So once again, we face here the difference between the community's self-understanding of the so-called New Testament and a different understanding of the Gospel, since, the, since Christians think of all these writings being included. Now realise this also touches on questions of what scriptural revelation can or should actually look like, and could letters written from one person to a community possibly fit into that category. And I'm well aware that's a, a common difference in perception. I just mentioned it in passing. I'm not going to try to solve it all now. But, uh, so the, in other words, the inclusion of epistles by someone like Paul um, is, a un, is an unfamiliar um, category in Muslim thinking about, shall we say, wahi and Quran. Again, brings together the questions about divine inspiration and human involvement and whether they can coexist. But putting those on one side, I'd just like to outline some of the writings on Paul and briefly reflect. Um, it seems to me from my reading there are three different broad positions on the Apostle Paul. One is the relatively neutral, short accounts. So, for example, in Ibn Ishaq's Sirah, The Life of Muhammad, um, he simply he writes this, quote, Those whom Jesus, son of Mary, sent, both disciples and those who came after them in the land, were Peter the disciple and Paul with him. Paul belonged to the followers and was not a disciple. A follower rather than a companion. So he's translating that quite accurately, you could say, into uh, Muslim terminology. Uh, Tabari records this same tradition. Uh, and he also adds that Nero, the Roman emperor, crucified Paul head down in Rome. Now these relatively neutral accounts are quite brief. Here was Paul, some small detail, that's all. Um, however, there are different traditions of accounts of Paul uh, in Muslim texts as well. And th these seem to fall into two broad categories. One is that he was responsible for introducing error about the doctrine of God, monotheism, tawhid, you know, introducing new ideas about Jesus being divine. 
Now that, that may have been sincere error, but it was error. So he, he was wrong on doctrine. That's the second position. Um, the third position is more negative than that, is Paul as conspirator, as plotter, deliberately deceiving, uh, deliberately intending to corrupt Christian teaching. And you find this in, uh, in different writings. It's a fascinating study of itself, which I've been exploring. So what was his motive for that, for example? And within Muslim texts, you, different motives are, are offered. For example, he, uh, he pretends, in these he's often um, emphatically a Jew. He pretends to convert to Christianity, um, but doesn't do so sincerely. In fact, his plan is to alter the teachings of Christianity so that they are less attractive, so as to preserve the people of Israel, the, the Jews, to stop Jews going over to becoming followers of Jesus. That's, that's the, that's the m motive behind the conspiracy. Um, the earliest account of this you find in <coughs> Saif ibn Umar, who's a, a, a prominent source for parts of Tabari's history. Um, well, Tabari actually doesn't use him on the Apostle Paul at all. He leaves that completely aside. Um, but that's why Saif ibn Umar is quite well known. But until recently, his works were... were lost and only preserved in the works of others, but 20 years ago an edition was found and produced. You can read the Arabic text and an English translation in different works of Saif's account of Paul, because Paul was the conspirator. Um, now there's more we could say about that and, and where these conspiracy theories come from. It's, it's interesting as well, um, because you find similar things in Jewish writings as well. And also, in Jewish writings, Paul is the good Jew acting to protect Jews from Christianity. Um, anyway, the negative Muslim views of Paul, where they are negative, historically, and his teaching, are not usually discussed in the context of the question of the status of the New Testament, but th that's why it's of interest to me briefly here today. Usually, Paul is discussed in the context of accounts of the rise of historic Christianity, or issues of doctrine. Um, however, they clearly have important implications for the meaning of Injil and how Muslims and Christians might understand one another. And he said Injil is Injil, the whole of the New Testament or not. Could it be? If Paul is at best mistaken, or worse than that, he is a deceiver, his writings cannot be accepted as in any way divinely inspired. It's interesting that the Mu'tazilite scholar Abdul Jabbar, active in Ray in modern Iran, uh, about 900 years ago, 1,000 years ago. In giving an account of Paul and the corruption of Christianity, he barely mentions the issue of the status of Paul's writings. And uh, I think I put... Actually, no, Abdul Jabbar isn't on that bibliography. I can give you details if you want to. Find it's in his work, Tafbit Allah El al -Nibuwa. He gives a favourite, quite well-known, lengthy account of things to do with the, the origins of uh, historic Christianity. Oh yes, um, so, but Abdul Jabbar barely mentions the status of Paul's writings, although he has things to say about Paul. It's so obvious to him that they cannot possibly be regarded as scripture. Yet focusing on the Gospels alone, as I've mentioned, is not engaging fully with Christian self-understanding as to what the, New what the New Testament is. So this returns us to the question of whether Injil refers to Gospels alone, or a proposed alternative gospel, or possibly to the whole New Testament, if rightly interpreted. If it is the last of these, then some consideration of Paul comes into play. And just very briefly to say this, as you know, there's no explicit reference to Paul in the Quran, although he is occasionally understood by some interpreters as being referred to in Surah Yasin, verse 13. <coughs> I'll just read this in English. Quote, when we sent to them two messengers, they denied them both. So we reinforced them with the third, and they said, Verily, we have been sent to you as messengers. Now, there's one tradition within Abt Tabari, uh, and then later commentators as well, which interpret one of these messengers as being a reference to Paul, and the city being the city of Antioch, which is the home of, if you like, the place of the states in the New Testament. This is the place where the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. 
historically very significant. Now, right on the border of modern Syria and Turkey. Anyway, that's by the way, but you will find the tafsir which says, you know, this is, this is talking about Antioch, that's why I mentioned it, and, and Paul. But that's only one view, I mean, not, not by no means all say that, obviously. Anyway, let me just draw together some concluding thoughts. I feel, I was about to say, seventhly, that reminds me of a story where we have two, there were two uh, philosophers walking along, and uh, someone overheard them talking as they went past, and one of them said to the other, and ninthly, <laughs> uh, I don't think I've reached those dizzy heights, but I can only say and seventhly when I've got the, something written in front of me. Um, it appears that in Muslim and Christian discussions, there is an ambiguity over what Injil could be. Uh, this is partly witnessed in some of the different Muslim discussions over how to identify it. Secondly, there is an expectation that the Quran regards Christians as responsible for responding rightly to God's revelation. In other words, within the Quran, there is that challenge to respond, which indicates that they possessed enough of that revelation, particularly about Muhammad, to form a right judgment. But was that a command to follow Muhammad, or was it principles and laws taught by Jesus, or more broadly, the New Testament rightly interpreted? What was it that Christians are thought to have? Finally, a wider question presents itself. What are the implications of these questions about the Quranic Injil for Muslim academic study of the New Testament Gospels? Abdullah Said suggests that, quote, if the texts have remained more or less as they were in the 7th century CE, the reverence the Quran has shown them at the time should be retained even today, unquote. As I said, I think Abdullah Said stands at one end of the spectrum more positive view. This implies that serious study of the New Testament Gospels by Muslim scholars is a worthwhile and legitimate, ta legitimate activity, amongst many other activities. Yet when Said mentions reverence, he favours the Quran's theoretical endorsements of the Injil in principle. Yet of course the Quran also rejects certain important details which are taught in the New Testament Gospels. This difference between acceptance in principle and rejection of details, specific teachings, seems to underlie the variation which characterizes Muslim writers' responses to the idea of the Injil. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Okay, wonderful. We'll have some time, hopefully, for, for questions and comments and discussion. on the eternity of the apparent meanings of the Qur'an. And they ought to be understood today in their apparent capacity. And on the other hand, there is now this idea that the reference to Injil at the time of Revelation was to another Injil, as opposed to one that is existing today. But uh, these verses would make clear that whichever Injil is there at any given time, whether same or otherwise, ought to be the point of reference for those verses. If, if the verse is eternal, and eternally addressing the community of the Christians, and the Quran also insists that the Christians shall exist till the end of um, uh, the human existence. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just thinking whether they're being inconsistent with their own theology. being slow here. You see, the Muslims yes, have this insistence upon the eternity of the Qur'an. Yes. In its um, literal, apparent meaning. Yes, the Zahir. Mm. So, yeah. so if the Qur'an says um, in Surah Maidah, فَلْيَحْكُمْ mm. أَهْلُ Injil بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فِيهِ then that is eternally being addressed mm. to the Christians. Mm. So the 21st century Christians are being told let them judge in accordance with the Injil. Right. Now, which Injil is that? Whichever one is found with the Christians. Right. So obviously, that should be a valid 
point of reference for the Christians. Right. So then, so and then there's no, and then there's no need for them to go out and say, well, the Injil today is not the Injil that the Quran was referring to. That's the first thing. Because otherwise, the verse loses its ongoing force. And That's right. There's yes. nothing to refer to. Right. I'm with you. Yeah. And then the verses also stay. That you are on no grounds until you establish the Torah in Injil. This also, I mean, to me, I understand it, that in principle, in essence, in its morality and spirituality, there actually is no difference between any revelation. If you look at the Quran from the 6,666 verses, the least important aspect of the Quran are the verses that talk about the law or the fiqh. The important aspects of the Quran are its morality and its spirituality. So why can't the Muslims understand the, Chris, uh, the Injil and the Torah in the same capacity? That in essence, it's the same word of God. I'm just wondering. Mm. Why can't Muslims understand? I know, I'm supposed to ask myself. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not <laughs> qualified to answer that. Yes. No, but because you're an expert in the yeah, area, yeah. you've had a lot of reading. Is there yes. anybody who said that? Well, I mean, yes, I mean, obviously there are some. As I said, there's a range here, um, including, interesting, someone like Ibn Taymiyyah. He's just fresh in my mind because I heard all about him yesterday. You know, he would often be regarded as, you know, he's well known for being, I don't know if stringent is the right word, you know what I mean, stern and, and, and strict in certain ways. And he actually takes quite an accommodating view, at least at the level of principle, saying, you know, I'll, the Christians claim this, and I will grant them most of it, he says something along those lines. Um, but you, you get a, a quite a range of, of views. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's, there's, there are plenty of, perhaps one could say, semi-popular works today. Though know, this obsession by the Muslims to justify the verse mm. by saying that there are two versions of the I wonder where that comes from. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think you know, as I said, at sort of more popular level, there's a there's a straightforward assumption. You know, obviously, what passes for the Injil for the Gospels today is clearly not the not the real thing, or at least, you know, it's it's, it's a mixture, it's a blend of, of right and wrong, um, which obviously point, leads one to the question: How do you sort out the right from the wrong? And then yeah. the fair I guess because, as you mentioned, the discourse of Tahrir. Yeah. Yeah, but you, yes, but so you do get you do get a, a range mm -hmm. of views in answer. There isn't one. I mean, far be it for me to say, but there isn't one Muslim answer to some of these questions. But as you know, it's different ones. Yeah. We have this problem as well sometimes. It's when we're getting going, the <laughs> building work. Yeah. So we. questions on ourselves. Maybe uh, just uh, um, something from the Christian's history perspective. Yeah. Is there um, is is there literature ascribed within the Christian tradition which has been dictated by Jesus Christ? Or, or is the compilation of the Gospels, uh, as you describe here, these are accounts of predominantly Jesus and then the, the yeah. views of Jesus, is there anything which has been ascribed to him or which would then fit more in this discourse of the Muslim vision of revelation of a coming down to a prophet, and then the prophet's done something with it. Not, not the idea. Well, I mean, what the way you've described it there as as a coming down to the prophet is obviously a very Islamic category. Yes. So that that kind of particular <coughs> dynamic isn't at work. Yeah, the, the New Testament Gospels have plenty of teachings in the mouth of Jesus himself. You know, for example, I mentioned Rashid Ridar and the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus said, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, love your enemies, all sorts of exhortations like that. That's not so much, I mean, you could, you could call it dictated, I suppose, but certainly it's, it's a record of, it presents itself as being a record of what Jesus actually said. But there are also then accounts of, you know, Jesus went to this place and spoke to this, these people and did these things. And that's regarded as of a piece, it's all part of the message about Jesus. That answers the question. So we, we don't have we don't have literature specifically um, claiming that Jesus asked us to write this down, for example. 
I'm um, just given the impression that it's led from here on. Because I mean, the typical Muslims who were, or a typical Muslim, as well, you said, they compare it. This is like Hadith literature. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, so this becomes true. like Hadith yes. literature. So do yeah. you have any accounts of any literature which doesn't quite have that tone? You know, which is almost which has more come from Jesus, who's suggesting they collect this stuff. Or yes, um, not it, not in the Gospels. I mean, the Gospels are. Only as I said, they say, you know, this is, a, this is an account of what Jesus said and did and so forth. I mean, you do have in the New Testament, the, the, usually the last collected book, the book of Revelation, or the Apocalypse, which is understood to be revelation from the ascended Jesus, if you like. And um, if you read the beginning and end of that, it makes that plain. It's, you know, it's interesting, to actually, to think to what extent does that particular book of the New Testament actually is closer to Islamic categories in in certain ways, I don't need to explain that too much. Um, but I think in general, the, the point is that yes, um, our categories of discussion are a bit different, and it's that clarification of categories that often doesn't be, doesn't happen, and can lead to people just talking like this. Yes, we had um, a scripture reading session on Monday, I think one of the groups actually dealt with this, this ah, question. Right, yeah. right. So I, I suppose it, another way to answer the question is it might be, um, no, but Christians don't see that as a, as a deficient subject because they're thinking in different categories. Yes. Is it true that uh, when you ask a question to the Christian, don't call the authority, Christian authority, where is the injury of the Quran that the Quran mentions? And they say that G the self of Jesus itself is injured. So is that true that they consider Jesus himself as the angel that the Quran is referring to? Um, oh, there are two very interesting questions there together. Um, let, let me try and go stepwise so I do them justice. Um, it is what is true, and I think this relates to part of your question, is that Christians traditionally would see, if we, if we ask the question, what's the primary revelation? Well, in Islam, you would say the Quran. In Christian, Christianity, traditionally, you would say G the person of Jesus. He is the revelation. Um, I mean, in, and, and the New Testament and the Gospels are the inspired record of that revelation. So the revelation is a person rather than a book. So now, it's true what, what they're trying to tell us too, is that the understanding. But if you're then saying, yes, is, is Jesus himself the Injil to which the Quran refers? Well, well that's not the Quranic understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose you could, if you put it in the way I've just framed it, you could come up with that solution, but I wouldn't want to pretend that, I wouldn't want to then say, oh, you know, what this Quran verse is really saying is this. Um, but it might be another way, an alternative way to understand it, if that answers what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Quran seems quite clear that the Injil is something sent down to Jesus. Um, you mentioned that you haven't read any of the Shiite sources. Um, yeah, not I'm, to date. Yeah, yeah, I know there, there is a book, book, and I have a copy, but I haven't read it. I've only read brief bits of it in the past. Mm. And it's called uh, the Shiite Sunnite Perspective on Narrations of Jesus. It's about an inch thick. Um, and it, as I remember, it actually um, transmits sayings of Jesus as moral guides and mm. parables. And I was reading at a time when I was in dialogue with um, a Christian um, Hebrew Bible study scholar, and um, we were both really surprised at what we actually found was the similarity between mm. what was claimed by the Shia Imams, um, interpersonal Bibles, I come from a Christian background, mm. and, um, and what's in the Quran too. I think I remember um, a passage about comparing backbiting to eating the flesh of your brother, for example. Mm. Um, so that might be worth looking at. I think mm. I'm send you um, the link. It's online, it's on Amazon.org. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure the whole thing's there, but I have actually the book form as well. Right, because if it's an inch thick, I, I've got a quite a slim little thing, which, which yeah. sounds in some way similar to Shia publication about yeah. sayings of Jesus, but it's certainly yeah. not an inch thick. It, um, yeah, let me check. But I think I'm pretty sure that it was, yeah, it's this entire, mm. the whole thing about mm. Jesus. Mm. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's another whole interesting area of, 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 stu of study is Jesus as understood in these different yeah. Maybe that would faith traditions. Yeah. 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 Um, is there a concept of tahrif um, amongst the Christians? 
Tahrif of, of what? Of, of the Bible. Of the Bible. Yeah. Um, well, Christian scholars, or sometimes, if you want to call them Western scholars, who may or may not be particularly Christian, have, in the last couple of hundred years in particular, have had lots of analysis of the biblical text from all sorts of different points of view. So there are some scholars um, who would say, well, yes, you know, this part of the Gospels really goes back to Jesus, and these other parts don't. Now, whether that, I mean, they wouldn't obviously use the term tahrif, they wouldn't necessarily call it uh, corruption, but they have all these different forms of biblical criticism which have emerged in recent centuries. And these are, to, to my mind, unresolved debates. I mean, you can find intelligent people on all sides of them, but you can't come to somewhat different conclusions. Um, traditionally, I mean, traditionally as in, you know, through the, the course of centuries in history, no, I mean, the, the Bible, the Bible, the biblical text was regarded as, as authoritative and inspired, even though it was always understood also that, you know, as I said, it had authors, which I know is not a, a very Muslim way of approaching the, the scripture. Um, so yes, you can pick up books that have all sorts of different views on the Bible these days, some more helpful than others, or more in agreement than others. Um, so in terms of the possibility of alteration, it's not something that was dealt with historically? Oh yes, I mean, well, I mean, the other, the other relevant discipline, I suppose, is what we call textual criticism in the technical sense of the term, which Christians have engaged in, which is look, which is comparing manuscripts, um, not textual criticism and saying, you know, this bit doesn't make sense or whatever, but, but analysing which manuscripts provide the most reliable readings and take us back to the, the most reliable reading. And that's something, I have a book on the history of that, I can't immediately off the top of my head. I mean, I think early church figures in the early centuries were sort of, aware of that a little, I'd have to check it all out, and I mean that's an extensive study. There's been one or two studies of that in Quranic context, but obviously that's much more unusual. But I mean, it's something that is usually done with all ancient texts, you know, if you have, you know, Latin works about Roman history, you know, how, what manuscripts do we have, how far back do they go, how reliable are they? So textual criticism in that neutral sense of, of, of trying to uh, clarify what is the Thank you very, very much. I think we thank uh, Marty once more for doing some of the things that are very, very important to us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I think there's many things which you raised which is maybe creating questions, at least for myself, which I haven't thought about previously. So, great. greatly, greatly appreciate it. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I think we've got some tea and biscuits and...